would please and go to the Chronicles, First Chronicles chapter number 21. First Chronicles chapter number 21. Let me say that I'm glad that each of you are here. How many had family come in for Thanksgiving or you visited family at Thanksgiving? Would you raise your hand? You had family come in or you visited Thanksgiving or family at Thanksgiving? Wonderful. My daughter was home for Thanksgiving. She flew in on Wednesday, had to fly back on yesterday, and um, we took her to the airport. I was going to try to play golf yesterday morning, but uh, I realized that my daughter was leaving the middle of the day and not the beginning of the day, so I wasn't able to play golf, but y'all feel bad for me. And uh, maybe next Thanksgiving, but uh, <laughs> we, uh, we had her home for a little bit and took her to the airport. And, uh, you know, my wife and I are going through this different phase in life. And so if you have to hear about it, just bear with us. But uh, she, uh, she got on the airplane. My wife's watching her go through, you know, security and all this kind of good stuff, you know. Of course, the three boys are in the background, you know, laughing and joking and making videos. You know, me and my wife are crying, you know. She gets on the airplane and we leave and trying to be there for my wife and help her, you know. And my sons, my sons say, Mom, you know what heals the cracks in a broken heart, don't you? And she said, what, son? He said, Chick-fil-A milkshakes. <laughs> The sensitivity of young men is just a blessing, isn't it? <laughs> and so you say, what did you do? Well, I had to help the family is all I can say. And so I uh, thank the Lord the line at Chick-fil-A wasn't too long. Amen. And I will say I didn't get a milkshake. I let everybody else get one. I just wallowed in my sadness, but uh, <laughs> they enjoyed it. But, uh, you know, we have so much to be thankful for. The life that we've been given is a gift from the Lord. And what we do with that life will matter in eternity. When we think about the weight that that carries, that statement carries, what we do in this life will matter in eternity. How we invest our life and, uh, you know, something that is valuable to us, we don't spend it, we invest it. We invest our life, the things that we invest our life in, the things that we do on this earth matter in eternity. I don't want to be the kind of Christian who does just enough to get by. I want to sell out and live it all for the Lord. Because that is the only life that is the blessed life. The Lord said that in this life we'll have tribulation, we'll suffer persecution. But He told us that we're to be of good cheer. I'm so thankful that God has given us the opportunity to live for Him. In a day that it's becoming less and less popular to stand for truth and right. But truth and right never change. God determined that a long time ago. And may the Lord help us have the strength to stand for Him and live for Him, to count for Him, to be what we should be for Him. And to stand before Him one day and hear the words, Well done, thy good and faithful servant. For all of eternity, we'll get to enjoy the fruits of our labor here on this earth. May God help us to take the 70 years that He's given us, the 80 if we're lucky, and live them for Him. Amen? If you're here this morning and you don't know the Lord, let me say God loves you. And I'm glad that you're here. And today can be a day that changes your life, not for just this moment, but for all of eternity. There are some people who live and they have an intellectual religion. It has to be thought through. It has a process. They have to be able to comprehend it and understand it. There's some people who live and they have an emotional religion. If they're not feeling good, they're not doing good. If they don't feel something, they're discouraged. But I'm so glad today that I can have a relationship based upon Jesus Christ. Not just my feeling and not just my intellect. But the Bible said these things have I written unto you that you may know that you have eternal life. It is based upon truth. You know, feelings change. People's ideas, their thought processes change. But God never changes. And the truth of God's Word is what settles my eternity. The fact that it is based upon what Jesus Christ not only said, but what He did. I can rest assured in the eternity that I have. I hope you know the Lord. And I can say this to you, that a God that will save you for eternity 
is a God that can change your life today. A God that will change your eternity is a God that will change your life today. God can make a difference. God has the answer that you've been looking for if you'll simply come to Him. First Chronicles this morning, look in verse number 1 of chapter 21. First Chronicles chapter 21, verse number 1. We've been preaching on the subject of our enemy, the devil. The devil attacks our lives. He attacks everything good that God is trying to accomplish, Satan is after. Satan wants your life. He wants to destroy it. He wants to ruin your home. He wants to ruin your children. He wants to ruin our church. He wants to ruin our testimony. And we come this morning to a passage of Scripture we find in 1 Chronicles dealing with a man named David. The Bible says in verse number 1 that Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. And David said to Joab, To the rulers of the people, Go, number Israel from Beersheba even to Dan, and bring the number of them to me that I may know it. And Joab answered, The Lord make his people a hundred times so many more as they be. But my Lord the king, are they not all the Lord's servants? Why then doth the Lord require this thing? Why will he be a cause of trespass to Israel? Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab. And wherefore, Joab departed and went throughout all of Israel and came to Jerusalem. And Joab gave the sum of the number of the people unto David. And all they of Israel were a thousand thousand and a hundred thousand men that drew the sword. And Judah was four hundred and three score and ten thousand men that drew the, score, drew the sword. But Levi and Benjamin counted he not among them. For the king's word was abominable to Joab. And God was displeased with this thing. Therefore he smote Israel. And David said unto God, I have sinned greatly because I have done this thing. But now I beseech ye, do away with the iniquity of thy servant. For I have done very foolishly. And the Lord spake unto Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and tell David, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I offer thee three things. Choose thee one of them, that I may do it unto thee. So Gad came to David and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Choose thee either three years of famine, or three months to be destroyed before thy foes, while that the sword of thine enemies overtake thee. Or else three days the sword of the Lord, even the pestilence in the land, and the angel of the Lord destroyeth all the coast, throughout all the coast of Israel. Now therefore advise thyself what word I shall bring again to him that sent me. And David said unto Gad, I am in a great strait. Let me fall now into the hand of the Lord. For very great are his mercies. But let me not fall into the hand of man. So the Lord sent pestilence upon Israel. And there fell of Israel 70,000 men. And God sent an angel into Jerusalem to destroy it. And as he was destroying, the Lord beheld and he repented him of the evil. And said to the angel that destroyed, It is enough. Stay now thy hand. And the angel of the Lord stood by the threshing floor of, floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. And David lifted up his eyes and saw the angel of the Lord stand between the earth and heaven, having a drawn sword and his hand stretched out over Jerusalem. And David and the elders of Israel, who were clothed in sackcloth, fell upon their faces. And David said unto God, Is it not I that commanded thee, commanded the people to be numbered? Even I it is that have sinned and done evil indeed. But as for these sheep, what have they done? Let thine hand, I pray thee, O Lord, my God, be upon me. In my father's house, but not on the people, that they should be plagued. And the angel of the Lord commanded Gad to say to David, that David should go up and set up an altar unto the Lord in the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. And David went up at the saying of Gad, which he spake in the name of the Lord. 
If I were to ask you this morning what you thought of when we mentioned the name David. Most of the younger folks in here and most of us would automatically think about David and Goliath. That great warrior who as a young man went out and stood before the giant that no one else would stand before and slew him that day that all the earth would know that there is a God in Israel. What a great day that was. Aren't you glad that God is still able to prove He is God? Not because of the words of man, but because of the acts of an almighty God. I'm so thankful that we have a God that can accomplish the impossible. That what man may look at and say it cannot be done, God says it can. If we were to think about David, we would think about David and Goliath. If I were to mention David's name again, we would think about David and Bathsheba. And if I were to ask you today, what, were, what was David's great sin? Many people might say his adultery with Bathsheba. But I believe this morning that David's great sin was not the adultery with Bathsheba. But David's greatest sin was the sin of numbering the people. David's, the result of David's sin with Bathsheba left four dead. David's sin of numbering the people left 70,000 dead. There's always a cost to sin, no matter how great or small we think it is. By the way, big sins and little sins, all sin, put Christ on the cross. All sin is a sin against God first. But we find here something interesting in the beginning part of the passage that we read in chapter 21, verse number 1. Look what the Bible says. And Satan stood up against Israel. And Satan stood up against Israel. We, we've understood and we understand that Satan will attack our mind. As he came to Eve in the Garden of Eden and created doubt in what the Lord had said, Satan will attack our life as he came to Job. And in just a moment's time, Job lost everything that he had. We find that Satan will come to us as an accuser before the Lord and try to make us insignificant in God's will. But we find here that Satan comes to Israel. He comes to a man more specifically by the name of David. And he attacks his will. And Satan's design in attacking our will is to make us independent of God's will. When Satan seeks to attack our will or to influence our will, his plan is to make us independent of God's will. And the way that he does this is through pride. There's a little bit of pride in all of our life. As a matter of fact, if we're not careful, pride can swell up and become consuming in every one of our lives. But we find here David numbering the people. Satan comes and he desires to influence David to be independent of the will of God. Let me make just a few opening statements this morning as we think about this idea of Satan attacking our will. Every one of us have a will. Man is made up of three parts, intellect, emotion, and will. Intellect, emotion, and will. What we choose to do, our will is what we choose to do. I said just a moment ago that there are some people who are interested in an intellectual religion. There are some people who are interested in an emotional religion. Uh, religion, but intellect and emotion changes, but our will must always be based upon truth, upon what is right. And the Bible says here that Satan comes to David and he says, David, let's number the people. You say, well, Pastor Brian, what's the point? Well, what's the big deal? I don't believe the great sin was, was David wanting to know the number of the people. But I believe when you read the verses here, you'll find David's great sin. Look with me, if you would, please, in verse number 2. And David said to Joab, the rulers of the people, Go number Israel from Beersheba even to Dan, and bring the number of them to me. Get this, that I may know it. That I may know it. He doesn't say, go number the people so that we can glorify God for what He has done. Don't, he doesn't say, go number the people so that we can praise the Lord and we can give honor to God for His blessing in our life. David wants to know this number for one reason. 
so that he can know it. So that I can know it. Can I say to us, every one of us this morning, that God, if we were to try to number the blessings of God in our life, we would leave many out. If we were trying to number the blessings of the Lord in our life, we would miss a few. We would miss a lot, many, many of us. But all of the goodness and all of the blessing and all the, the hand of God upon our lives is not a result of who we are. It's not a result of the church that we go to. It's not a result of, of the, the family that we come from. It is a result of the blessing of God, the goodness of the Lord. And David says, I want to know the number. And what begins to creep in? Pride. He has some wise counsel near him in verse number 3. And Joab said, the Lord make the people a hundred times so many more as they be. Joab says, David, we've been blessed to the Lord so much, we, we can't even, whatever number we think of, it'll be way more than that. David in verse number three, or Joab says in verse number three, but my Lord the king, are they not all the Lord's servants? Are they not all the Lord's servants? Why then doth the Lord require this thing? Why will he, why will he be a cause of trespass to Israel? Joab says, David, this isn't wise. Pride is wicked. Pride brings destruction. Every one of us have a will. Our will, secondly, is what we choose to do. What we choose to do. David makes a choice here to do something because he's filled with pride. And Satan attacks his will. I don't believe, I believe the Bible teaches us that a Christian can never be possessed by the devil. We cannot be filled with the Holy Spirit and possessed with the devil at the same time. Amen? And the Bible says in the book of John that those who know the Lord, God sends them the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, and we will have Him forever. Amen? So the Comforter, the Holy Spirit doesn't leave, and the, the devil cannot take up residence in our life as long as the Holy Spirit is present. We can never be possessed by the devil. Someone, Flip Wilson, said, the devil made me do it. We can never be possessed by the devil, but every one of us can be influenced by him. Every one of us can, can be influenced by the devil. We sometimes, the mistake that we make often in our life is believing that because we're a child of God and because we, we, we know the Lord and maybe because we go to church or we teach in a class or we serve in an area, that the devil's never going to have any influence in my life. Be very careful. Because the Bible says that the devil comes to David and he influences him to do the wrong thing. He influences him to do the wrong thing. Now recognize, David chose to do it, but Satan had a plan. And Satan will plant a seed and Satan will, will influence and he will push and he will prod to the smallest degree, to eventually accomplish what he wants to accomplish in your life. And David numbers the people. Pride always brings destruction. And we read later on, the Bible says that the Lord, look in verse number, look with me if you would please, over in verse number 7, and God was displeased with this thing. Therefore, he smote Israel. David numbered the people, but it wasn't David alone that suffered. Dad, you may make a decision that is against the will of the Lord. Listen to me, friend. What did David do? He did something out of the will of God. He went against God's will. He went against what was right. I said to our Crosspoint class this morning, listen, we have the Holy Spirit as a child of God. We have the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. And we're either doing one of two things. We're either walking with him or we're fighting against him. There's no middle ground. You're either walking with him or you're fighting against him. And in this passage, David's, David's fighting against God's will. He's fighting against, and the, the toughest choices are not good and bad. The toughest choices are good and best. 
David's fighting against what God knows to be best in his life. And because David goes and he does something outside of the will of God, he goes against the will of God, he makes a choice, he chooses to do that which is dishonoring and displeasing to the Lord. The consequences come. You say, well, Pastor Brian, he didn't do anything wicked. I mean, what's the big deal in counting the people? He's not like he went out and murdered someone. It's not. Hey, listen, David knew how David knew uh, the the depths of sin. He knew what it was like to try to hide his sin and cover it. He didn't go out and murder someone. He wasn't being wicked. Uh, he did, he didn't do this terrible evil deed. So what was the big deal? The problem was that David went against the will of God. David chose to do that which displeased the Lord. And in your life and in my life, while we may not think it's a big deal, getting outside of God's will is dangerous. Getting outside of God's will is displeasing to the Lord. The Bible says because of this decision, the Lord smote Israel. Not only did the Lord smote Israel and not only did God judge Jerusalem, the Bible says that 70,000 men fell. The decisions of our life are important. I think that it, 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 I believe the Bible teaches us that if we want to be successful in life, if we want to have the blessed life, if we want to be uh, pleasing to the Lord, then we have to live in His will. We have to do God's will. And we often say about God's will that it's day by day and, 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 and Lord help me day by day. But I, I believe even further than that, that the will of God is moment by moment. Moment by moment. In every moment of your life, God has a perfect will. And when we get out of sight, when we get outside of God's will, we get into that, we get into that area of our life when we choose to, to make those decisions that displease the Lord or to simply do that little thing that we know to be right or we know to be something God doesn't want, but yet we choose to do it or something that God wants and we choose not to do it, that simple little thing, we put ourselves in a position of danger. We put ourselves in a position of displeasing the Lord. And what does the Bible teach us about pride? It's always followed by destruction. You see, our will is the struggle. James teaches us, therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him it is sin. I don't believe, I, I know we, we, I said just a moment ago that we, we are living in a world, we're living in, in a country where it is becoming less and less popular to do what is right. And, and let me make it a, a little more specific. We're, we're living in a country, we live in a world and where it is becoming less and less popular to do the will of God. We're running from that. God has already set the standard. Here's what is right. Here's what I expect. Here's what I want. Here's, here's the answer to life's problems. More people take their life in the month of December than any other month of the year. People become so downtrodden and discouraged and defeated around this time of the year because they begin to measure success based upon other people. When we make those choices to get outside of the will of God, to choose to, to step outside the will of God, we're putting ourselves in a position of danger. We're putting ourselves in a position to displease the Lord and we will bring destruction in our life. But understand something, we choose to be there. God has given us the ability. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. God has given us everything we need necessary to be in His will. The only time that we get out of God's will is when we choose to do so. The only time you and I get out of God's will is when we choose to do so. And Satan shows up here, and listen, he's not attacking David's life. As a matter of fact, if you study the passage here, David's kingdom is at one of its highest points. He's successful in his military might. His people are doing well. The land is being blessed. He's not coming to David at a low point in life. 
He's not coming to David when he's struggling. He's not taking everything away from David. He's just trying to influence David to do something that is outside of the will of God. And it brings judgment. You say, Pastor Brian, what, am I, what are you trying to say to us this morning? Very quickly, very simple. The decisions of your life always have consequences. The choices, the things that we choose, no matter how simple or small we think they may be, have great influence upon the blessing of God in our life. In other words, you can't do whatever you want to do. You can't behave and act and possess an attitude or spirit based upon how you feel or what you think is right if it is outside the will of God and expect God to bless. God's not okay with a convenient Christianity. God's not okay with just a casual, let me just do what I can. That's not what God expects. God has a perfect will and our desire should be, God help me to be right in the center of where you want me. Because it's the moment that we get outside of God's will that it all blows up. David got himself in trouble. We have such a gracious and a merciful God. But the Lord comes to David and he says, David, he says, you're going to choose your punishment. And he gives him three choices. None of them are good. He gives him three choices. And David has to choose. Very quickly here, the decisions of your life, write this down, number one. The decisions of your life mold the character of your life. The decisions of your life mold the character of your life. It's been said about character that character is who you are when no one else is watching. I don't think that's true. Number one, it's not true because there's always somebody watching. Your character is who God knows you to be. Your character is not who you are when no one's watching because there's always someone watching. But our character is who God knows us to be. That is who we are. God knows us for who we are. God knows us for who we are. He knows who we are. God knows the mistakes. He knows the failures. He knows the faults. When He died at Calvary, He knew all those things. And yet He still died for you and me. Our character, our character is who God knows us to be. And the decisions of your life just reflect your character. The decisions of your life reflect what you think about God. Listen to me. Our, our desire should be, our goal should be not, to be, not to determine who's right and who's wrong, but our goal should be, God, am I in your will? Because if I'm in your will, even though I may be struggling, it's okay. Even though I may be going through a hard time, I'll be just fine. Why? Because the Lord said, I'm going to send the comforter, the Holy Spirit, and you'll have him forever. And listen, you'll, you'll, you'll be comforted, you'll be reproved, you'll be given wisdom. God will bless you with all of that. But it does not matter the right and wrong. What matters is, am I in God's will? That's not fair, Lord. This happened and it's not fair. Let's not speak to Jesus about being fair. Placed on him the sins of the whole world. He who knew no sin became sin for us. Brother Jimmy took your sin and he took my sin. And guess what? Not one time did he ever sin. The choices, the decisions in our life mold our character. The little things. You say, well, Pastor Brian, again, it wasn't a big thing. He just numbered the people. He just wanted to know how many people. It's not a big thing that, hey, when God is dealing with me that I pay attention. I'll take care of it next time. It's amazing to me how quickly and easily it is to put off things we know we should be doing to another time. God always gives us, or the devil always, the devil always, Satan stood up against Israel. The devil always gives us a reason why we can justify it. The choices in our life. The decisions in our life, they mold our character. 
What, is the, what are the decisions? They're, they're our will. What we're going to do. Secondly, write this down. Not only do the, the decisions in our life mold our character, but the decisions in our life chart the direction of our life. The decisions in our life chart the direction in our life. David had made wise decisions and God had blessed him. But David comes to a point here where Satan influences him and he makes a decision that displeases the Lord and God brings judgment and God's hand brings, brings a, a chastisement upon not only David but upon his people, but upon the people that he loves. And David has to plead with God, Lord, it was me that made the choice, not the people. Don't judge them. Lord, just judge me. They chart the course in our life. When we want success, by the way, you don't live any way that you won't do and one day say, hey, you know what? I need the blessing of God in my life. And all of a sudden, pray a little prayer and expect God to bless. No, the choices in our life have consequences. And when we make good choices, we have a good trajectory. But when we make wrong choices, we have the wrong trajectory. Let me say it again. When we make the wise choices, we have a good trajectory. We're going the right direction. But when we make decisions that lie outside of the will of God, we're going the wrong direction. And don't expect for those decisions to have a consequence. Don't expect it because they will. They'll bring judgment. Can't understand why I'm struggling. I can't understand why I'm dealing with this hard time. I can't understand why and all this and all, this and all these things that are going on. And my question is this. Are you and am I? In the will of God. Am I doing, am I, where God wants me to be? And no matter where that is, as long as it's where God wants me to be, then I'm where I should be. None of us want to be in those moments of challenge. None of us want to be in those moments of difficulty. But it's more important that we desire to be in the, in the will of God, in the moment that God wants us to be in. They chart our course, our will, the decisions that we make, they mold our character. The decisions that we make, they chart our course. Last thing will be done this morning. The decisions that we make, David made some decisions. Look what the Bible says. Turn over with me, if you would, please. Same chapter. The Bible says in verse number 13. And David said unto Gad, I'm in a great strait. I'm in a great strait. You know what, you know what David did? He jumped out of the, uh, what is it, out of the, Pot into the frying pan or something like that? <laughs> what is it? Somebody say it. Out of the pan in the fire. David went from bad to worse, didn't he? David says, listen, I'm going to number the people. Joab tried to tell him, hey, it's always good to be around and surround yourself with wise people. Don't ever get to the place you think you know it all. Because it's in those moments that you think you know it all, you'll fall flat on your face. Joab tries to tell David. Now, Joab didn't always do right, but Joab tried to tell David. He tried to tell David, David, I don't think this is the best thing to do. I don't think we should do this. And David says, hey, listen, I'm the king. You go do it. They come to a place where they make the decision. They give the number. David is filled with pride and God is displeased. And the Lord says, you have three choices. And look what he says in verse number 13. And David said to Gad, I am in a great strait. Let me fall now into the hand of the Lord. You know what David is praying now? David's praying now, Lord, Lord, let me just be in your will. Lord, let me just be in your will. The decisions in our life, the, the will of our life, the choices in our life, they mold our character. They chart our course. Thirdly, but they always lead us to consequence. Here's what David prays. He says, Lord, I was wrong. Let me fall into your hands. He says, let me be in your will. Let me, let me Lord, rest in your will. We're talking about judgment here. And the Lord said, David says... He says, but let me not fall into the hand of men. Let me fall into your will. David gets to the point in his life where he realizes that his only protection is the, is the simple will of God. Can you imagine? David's, David's probably got some enemies 
now. Because of what David's done, 70,000 men have died. Because of what David's done, God's hand is, God's judgment has come upon Jerusalem. It leads him to a consequence. What's that consequence? David prays, Lord, let me find your will. Let me, let me be in your will. You may be here this morning and you think, you know what, I, I like the life that I'm living right now. I can do whatever I want, act any way that I want, and come to church on Sunday and feel good about myself and go, go back out on Monday and do the same thing all over again. But don't mistake God's grace for acceptance. Don't mistake God's grace for acceptance. Just because God hasn't responded doesn't mean He's not going to. Just because God hasn't acted doesn't mean He's not going to. Can I tell you about our God? He's gracious, but He's also just. He's gracious, but He's also just. And there will come a time when the Lord's going to come to you and He says, you've got a choice. God gives us a choice to do His will or to reject His will, to live in His will or to live in our own will. God gives us that choice. But there's going to come a time when God's going to say, guess what? The choice is not my will or your will. The choice is judgment. The choice is consequence. The choice is you're going to have to live with the decisions that you make. You're going to have to live with the choices that you make. And sure, God's grace is sufficient, but David could never go undo the 70,000 homes that were destroyed because of his foolishness. It was just a one little thing. Go ask the family whose daddy's not sitting around the table anymore if it was a little thing. Go ask the family whose lives ruined because of one simple little decision. No, we better be careful with the choices we make. We better follow God's will. And no matter how often Satan comes to attack and how often Satan comes to, to, to push us away from what God says is right, may God give us the courage to do what's right. May God give us the courage to say, here's where I stand. I appreciate the things that God has allowed me to learn and I'm still learning But I had a dad who knew what it meant to just stand for right. He knew what it meant to when the time came and the pressure came and Satan came and he said, hey, you need to cave. He just did what was right. And doing what is right is not always going to be popular. It's not always going to win you the awards. It's not always going to put you on a pedestal with man but it'll honor God. Teach your young people. Teach your children. Hey, the decisions you make mold your character. It's not about what people, people, what you do when no one else is around or no one else sees. It's your character is what God knows about you. The decisions in your life, the wrong decisions, Some people think, well, that, those things aren't that big a deal. Maybe that one thing's not that big a deal. Maybe that one relationship's not that big a deal. Maybe that one situation is not that big a deal. But where does that lead to? Why? Because our decisions chart a course. There are things in my life that I wish I could go back and redo. There are things in my life that that I've seen, I've seen sometimes in my own life some situations and, and I've seen where I've allowed myself to, to kind of be swayed. or I, I know the devil's pushing. I know the devil's trying to influence. And I've let some things slip sometimes in my life. And you know what I want to do? Every, every time that I allow those things to slip, you know what I want to do? I want to go back and, and, and fix it. I want to change it. But you can't. And the longer we allow something to drift, to slip, to be moved, 
the further it gets from where God wants it to be. That's why your mom and dad, young people, come down and they say, hey, here's the rule, follow it. I don't care if you're mad or you don't like it. I don't care if you're glad about it, you're going to do it. Dad used to say, people say, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Whether we believe it or not, doesn't matter. God said it, that settles it. Do right. Pastor gets up and he preaches a message and he harps on something. And you think, man, why is he beating that dead horse? It's not a big thing. Because the longer we allow something to drift, the further it gets from where God wants it to be. Not only that, the longer we allow it to drift, the longer it takes to get back. Those decisions chart your course. And always remember that every decision has a consequence. It costs something. Can I tell you, it costs to get out of the will of God. It costs to get away from what God says is right. It costs to move. Just a simple decision outside of the will of God costs something. David gets out of the will of God. Satan can never take away our eternity. He can never remove the fact that I'm on my way to heaven. But Satan will do everything he can to get me out of God's will on this earth. Churches, if we're not careful, we'll, we'll harp on and we'll hit on those f- sins of the flesh. David's adultery, fornication, homosexuality, lying, stealing. We'll harp on those things. But we'll forget about those sins of the Spirit, won't we? You see, the prodigal son, his sin was obvious. He went to the far country. But the boy that stayed home was just as sinful. His just wasn't as noticeable. We better remember, if we're going to help this world, we're not going to help them with who we are. We're going to help them with who God is. And our job is to be like Christ. Our job is to imitate Him. Our job is to be what? In the center of His will. What's what's the devil trying to do? What's Satan going to do? He's going to come at us, try to make us independent of God's will. You don't need to do God's will. He's going to try to influence us to say, you don't need the Lord's will. Do your own thing. No, there's no greater life ever lived than the life that's lived for Jesus Christ. David just numbered the people. Well, that feels pretty good. I think I'll do that. And instead of them being God's people, they became David's people. And Joab said, wait, wait, wait. Aren't they all the Lord's servants? Be careful what we think we've accomplished. Before God shows us just how quickly, it's only because of His blessing. Lord, we love you this morning. God, I thank you.